It's the late 9th century and you are a peasant farmer living in Norway. Your country is in chaos. King Harald Fairhair is seeking to overturn the long-standing tradition of local independence that you and your people have come to know and love. Through alliances with the Northern Jarls, he has started subjugating the other regional kings, local leaders and countless free farmers, claiming to be the overlord of all of Norway. This is bad news for your livelihood. Having such a power-hungry tyrant ruling over you will certainly bring with it yet more expropriation of your wealth. This is something that you just can't afford to stick around for. But where can you turn? Much of Europe is also being ravaged by Viking kings, and those places that are able to resist Viking invasions have their own local tyrants to deal with. Then you get an idea. You heard about a place called Iceland that has no king and yet has been able to resist Viking invasion for quite some time. You decide to join other settlers in attempting to form a community there. Stick through to the end to learn of the trials that these settlers faced and how they dealt with them. Old Godzilla was hopping around, Tokyo city like a big playground. As the settlers came from many different parts of Europe, the Icelandic legal tradition was developed as a mixture of many different legal traditions, and as David Friedman notes, legal conflicts were of great interest to the medieval Icelanders. Njal, the eponymous hero of the most famous of the sagas, is not a warrior, but a lawyer, so skilled in law that nobody was considered his equal. In the action of the sagas, law cases play as central a role as battles. The structure of rights enforcement that the Icelanders came to was heavily market-oriented. Men would engage in a contractual relationship with a chieftain, called a gothi, who would act as a religious leader and an advocate in the event of any legal conflicts. The men who subscribed to a given gothi were called his thingmen, and importantly, this relationship was not territorial. The Gothi had no claim to the property of his thingmen, and they were free to transfer their allegiance to another Gothi at will. Iceland was not, however, entirely adherent to natural law anarchism. There did exist a national legislative body, called the Lagreta, which was made up of legislative offices of the Gothar, which were called Gothorth, where each Gothorth may be occupied by multiple Gothar at one time. These offices were treated as property and could be traded between different men or passed on to heirs. However, there was not free entry into the Lagreta. One could not simply declare himself a Gothi and establish a Gothorth to start voting at the Loretta. New chieftaincies had to be approved by the existing Gothar. However, it is still the case that this legislative body was relatively very limited in scope. As Roger Long notes, this parliament had no budget and no employees. It met only two weeks per year, and Jared Diamond points out that medieval Iceland had no bureaucracies, no taxes, no police, no army. Of the normal functions of governments elsewhere, some did not exist in Iceland, and others were privatised, including firefighting, criminal prosecutions and executions, and care of the poor. Law in Iceland was seen as a private matter, dealing with disputes purely through arbitration at courts known as things. These things were either embedded in the official state structure, or were set up privately by conflicting parties and their Gothar. So imbued were the Icelanders with the norms of conflict resolution through arbitration that they dealt with haunted houses in the same way, trying the ghosts for trespassing in the confident expectation that, if found guilty, a good Icelandic ghost would respect the verdict of the court and peacefully depart. Old Godzilla was hopping around, Tokyo City like a big playground. The provision of mutual aid in Iceland was in the form of the Hrepper a small communal unit that acted to mitigate against many common threats facing the free farmers. The exact inner workings of the Repper is unknown, but we do know that they provided support for the poor and orphaned, insured against fire damage and loss of livestock due to disease, and potentially many of the other insurable threats that would face the people at this time. In entry into the Repper, a farmer would need the recommendation of a member, and once in, Jews would have to be paid, similarly to the mutual aid that was developed in the United States far later. However, it does seem that once affiliated with the Repper, farmers were unable to change their affiliation to another at will, making it a less than ideal relationship. Old Godzilla was hopping around, Tokyo City like a big playground. The system eventually broke down into civil warfare in the 11th century, thanks to a consolidation of power into the hands of five families. These families were able to attain regional monopolies, seizing much of the farmland and chieftaincies thus transforming into warring states. However, even with these new mini-states forming and coming to blows, the level of violence was fairly low, as Friedman notes. During more than 50 years of what the Icelanders themselves perceived as intolerably violent civil war, leading to the collapse of the traditional system, the average number of people killed or executed each year appears, on a per capita basis, to be roughly equal to the current rate of murder and non-negligent manslaughter in the United States. This level of violence was perceived by the Icelanders to be so intolerable that they invited King Hakon of Norway to govern them. But how exactly did this consolidation of power come into being? A major culprit is the introduction of the tithe in 1096, made possible due to the country's conversion to Christianity a century earlier. As Long explains, the tithe, used to pay church officials and maintain church buildings, was Iceland's first real tax. Previous taxes generally turn out on closer inspection to be voluntary exchanges of fees for service. Assessed at 1% of the pair's property, it was also Iceland's 
person's first graduated tax. Earlier fees were one size fits all, and so it took in much more revenue. And more importantly, the tithe lacked a competitive element. Recall the non-territorial character of a chieftain's jurisdiction. A chieftain's temptations to self-aggrandizement were kept in check by the knowledge that if he acquired delusions of grandeur or charged too high a price for his services, his clients could abandon him for a rival. The tithe was territorial. All those who lived in a vicinity of a particular church building had to pay for its upkeep and were not at liberty to transfer their support elsewhere. The catch is that the portion of the tithe revenue allocated to maintaining church buildings went not to official church hierarchy, but to the wealthy private owners, usually chieftains, of Stathir church steads, i.e. plots of land on which the church has been built. The tithe was a property tax, but chieftaincies, though marketable commodities, were exempt, as were the church steads themselves predominantly owned by the chieftains. The parliament that enacted the tithe was also, of course, composed entirely of chieftains. The tithe thus did more than just increase the income of the chieftains. It decoupled that income from accountability. Economic inequalities per se are not a serious threat to liberty, so long as they operate in a genuine market context, where the way to gain and maintain wealth is to please one's customers. Before the introduction of the tithe, a chieftain who proved too power-hungry would alienate his customers and so suffer financial discipline. But chieftains who owned church steads now had a captive market, and so were freed from all competitive restraints on their accumulation of wealth and power. Through buying off or intimidating less wealthy chieftains, the top families were able to gain control of multiple chieftaincies. This gave them a lock on the parliament enabling them to pass still further taxes. It also decreased competition among chieftains, allowing them to charge monopoly prices and drive their clients into a serf-like state of debt and dependence. The Icelandic system did fall through an inherent flaw then, but not the one Diamond imagines. The free state failed not through having too much privatization, but through having too little. The tithe, and particularly the portion allotted to church dead maintenance, represented a monopolistic, non-competitive element in the system. The introduction of the tithe was in turn made possible by yet another non-competitive element, the establishment of an official state church which everyone was legally bound to support. Finally, buying up chieftaincies would have availed little if there had been free entry into the chieftaincy profession. Instead, the number of chieftains was set by law, and the creation of new chieftaincies could only be approved by parliament i.e. by the existing chieftains, who were naturally less than eager to encourage competitors. It is precisely those respects in which the free state was least privatised and decentralised that led to its downfall, while its more privatised aspects delayed that downfall for three centuries. As Hoppe has explained, unlike firms in a free market who live or die by public demand, the state lives or dies by public opinion. In short, as the state is made up of a relatively far smaller subset of the population than those producers, homesteaders and traders who are expropriated by the state, it relies on a state of favourable public opinion in order to continue its expropriation. Hoppe describes this as being analogous to the Marxist notion of class consciousness. That is, on the one hand, when the class consciousness of the expropriated class is low, their opinion of the exploitative methods of the state is that such exploitation is a good thing or at least something that should not be actively resisted. And on the other hand, when class consciousness is high, public opinion is such that the criminal conduct of the state in its expropriation is something to be resisted. We may apply this analysis to medieval Iceland as a means to determine the root of its failure more fully. Initially, as the settlers in the 9th century set up the legal apparatus, the public opinion of Icelanders was very much in line with natural law. That is, many Icelanders were directly escaping the exploitation of states back home, and thus would be apt to resist any attempts at exploitation in their new home. This is why we see no taxation in early Iceland. Unfortunately, however, the men of Iceland did not have a perfect grasp on private property or economics, and were rather proto-democratic in the way they set up their legretta, where the Goðorth would vote to decide law, and would have to vote to determine whether a new Goðorth would be allowed into the party. Such a monopolistic apparatus did indeed plant the seeds for future growth in statism as long as pointed out above. However, such a growth could only come about if public opinion was in its favour, which occurred due to the island's conversion to Christianity. The newly Christian population had a level of class consciousness such that the tithe was able to be introduced without active resistance from the expropriated. These new monopolistic earnings of the Godar would then allowed them to begin waging wars which further pushed public opinion in favour of alternative expropriation at the hands of King Hakon IV. Ultimately, a stronger grasp on natural law could have saved the Commonwealth and even pushed it into total anarchy. Thus, I reiterate Long's point that it was specifically those aspects in which Iceland was statist that led to its eventual downfall. This video provides an example of failed minarchy. If you want to learn more about the failings of minarchy, you have to watch this video where I present critical challenges to minarchists. This will allow you to more deeply understand the topic at hand.